Virginia Woolf casually predicting incels. Hermione becomes enslaved to Draco and he has to impregnate her. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Hello, hi, my name is Noni. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we're gonna be talking about all the books that I read in the past two months. There's more. It's just these are the ones that I have a physical copy of. I have quite the interesting selection of books this month. One of them is a fan fiction. You know what? Let's just start with that one. But before we get into the storm, that is the books that I read, let's talk about how I keep calm into my daily life because this video is sponsored by loop earplugs they are noise reducing earplugs which i love because they allow me the freedom to do whatever i want without getting overstimulated by noise all the time and loop is now introducing their solstice line so that is three beautiful new colors for each of their earplug types i have here the loop experience in ember sunrise I personally wear their experience line the most as they reduce noise, but not so much that you can't hear people talking anymore. You could still hear all the important things. I always take these with me when I'm on holiday. I recently went to Vietnam and I'm so happy that I had these with me because it's very noisy there. And I don't think I would have survived the days if I didn't have these earplugs with me. And I also now have the Loop Engage line in Series Sunsets. These are specifically tailored for when you still want to have clear conversations and hear yourself well. I feel like I'm just wearing a very cool piece of ear jewelry. Their earplugs come in different sizes, so you will always have one that will fit you. And they also come in these handy carrying cases which i like because i always just have one with me in my bag check out all their new colors by clicking the link in the description be sure to check them out i created a cute little cozy corner i have my little fox friend over here today in the video um he doesn't usually show up in my videos but i love him he's cute he still doesn't have a name. So there's this fan fiction that kind of blew up on TikTok, or I don't actually know if it blew up. It just appeared on my For You page. I decided to check it out out of curiosity, and it's kind of just slightly taken over my entire life. I technically haven't finished it because it's so long. This fan fiction is basically the length of three fantasy books uh, and I'm about two-thirds of the way into it so let's just pretend that I'm giving you an update of like two out of the three books of a trilogy you know and I just wanted I really just wanted to talk about it right now so the fan fiction that I'm talking about is Manacled by Sen Lin Yu okay I'm going to explain what this is about and you're going to think Leonie what is what are you reading and why are you recommending this to us and you're just gonna have to bear with me, okay? So this is Dramione fanfiction, which means that it's Harry Potter fanfiction shipping Hermione and Draco. Now, that doesn't sound too weird yet, I know. The thing is, I'm personally not super excited about Harry Potter ever since J.K. Rowling, and I just really, really disagree with all of her opinion so i try to avoid talking about it on this channel but you know this was a fan fiction written by sending you i'm also not a dramione shipper i've always been a shipper of ron and hermione but the tiktoks that people made about this fan fiction were unhinged so uh, you know i was curious so the concept of this fan fiction is Harry Potter meets The Handmaiden's Tale, which is a very sophisticated way of saying Hermione becomes enslaved to Draco and he has to impregnate her. See, this is the moment where you're gonna have to bear with me. In this fan fiction, Voldemort has won, Harry Potter is dead, and Hermione is taken prisoner, and she is becoming part of this repopulation plan of Voldemort, where all the strong wizard women are being used as surrogates to create offspring for 
all the Death Eaters and stuff. So that's the Handmaiden's Tale influence. Hermione gets paired up with the right hand of Voldemort, like the highest commander, which turns out to be Draco Malfoy. Um, and what's interesting about her is that part of her memories of the war have been closed off by magic. She doesn't know what has happened to her. No one can see into her mind to see what has happened to her and the story is basically this mystery of trying to figure out what has happened to Hermione, what has she done and why these memories are closed off. And it's genuinely well done. Like the tension deeply goes into like the mental psychology of Hermione as a prisoner. It touches on interesting themes like how much violence should you allow in a war and how much violence should you allow to try to win the war and avoid further casualties on your own side. This story just truly gripped me by the throat and made me read until like 2 a.m. in the night which I haven't done since I was a teenager, like reading this made me feel like a teenager again. I have to warn you though that this is a dark fic. Half of the story is really just Hermione going through it and just having the absolute worst time of her life. It's not fun. It's not fun. You will feel pain. You will feel awful, you will feel dread deep, deep, deep down into your soul. Uh, and then there will be a brief moment where you're like, oh, oh, uh, I'm a little giddy. Oh, look at me. I'm actually kind of like blushing right now. And then pain again. Sometimes there's just something very cathartic about reading about dread and pain. And I cannot explain that. But I think if you read a lot of fan fiction, you will understand. Now, I never thought that I would say this about a fan fiction, <laughs> but this story has everything that I have been looking for in a novel for a very long time. It's a super twisted, poignant relationship between two people. You guys know that that is the kind of stuff that I just really love. Like, yes, it's a Dramaini fan fiction, but their relationship is very twisted. There's a lot wrong with it, but it's not necessarily romanticized, like that's just part of the plot. You're just reading about this very twisted and difficult relationship and it's psychological. It's so good, it's so good. It has the main character becoming slightly more and more morally gray. It has that trope where the enemy is teaching the main character how to do magic because no one else is willing to do it. <laughs> Endless loop of her comfort. No, not her comfort, more like extreme hurt, so much hurt, just endless and endless heaps and heaps of hurt, and then a little bit, tiny, tiny little sliver of comfort. I think we all have some tropes where we don't really have an explanation for why we love them so much, and for me that's mind invasion. Should be used more often, in my opinion, and I don't know why, but I love it. I love it. And then it's also just very dark and twisted and gory, which I enjoy. I will give another update in the next wrap up when, when I finish this. I'm about two thirds of the way through. I genuinely really enjoy it, but I have a hard time recommending it. If you want to read this, check the trigger warnings because I cannot emphasize enough that this is a dark fic. It is written for people who enjoy dark stories. It was never written with like a mainstream audience in mind, even though it now has kind of gained more like widespread success. So just know that. And before you ask, yes, I did consider making a video about this fan fiction because I totally understand that a lot of you might want to know what this is about, but are not interested in reading a trilogy worth of fan fiction. But I decided against it. There are a lot of very sensitive and dark subjects that are touched upon in the story. And if I I were to make a video about this just telling you all the plot beats that are happening i don't think that would make anyone feel good it just wouldn't be a funny haha video and i also think i wouldn't do the story justice so that's why i decided to not make a video about it if someone else wants to make a video about it then you can watch that i rambled about that for a very long time i had to I'm not sorry. Moving on to the actual published written novels um, that I read this month. So I listened to an audiobook called Manipulation, which is shock and surprise, 
about manipulation. It's a very short audiobook that talks about all the different ways in which people can manipulate. On the one hand, to kind of recognize it when it's happening to you, but also to recognize it in yourself. Because like the author said, a lot of people use manipulation tactics without like deliberately wanting to. This is also a great read um, to kind of help yourself to stop manipulating people. I will say, I did not make notes while reading this and I probably should have because I forgot every single thing. I remember listening to this and thinking, that's insightful, but apparently not insightful enough that I remember it. So, okay, let's talk about some books that I have more interesting things to say about. Um, so I read a lot of cozy fantasy the past months. I have an entire video about this specifically where I go very, very in depth into them. Uh, I will link it up there so you can click it and see the whole cozy little vlog that I made around it. But if you just want the the spark notes updates uh, on these three cozy fantasy books i will give them right now the first one that i read was legends and lattes i think the most well-known cozy fantasy book nowadays it is about an orc that decides to leave behind her life of fighting monsters and going on quests to open a coffee shop very cute. When I started reading this, I was into it. I think I, I couldn't stop reading. I think I read like the first 100 pages in one go, which is a lot for me. And then it just kind of went downhill. This is one of those books where after the first 100 pages, I was like, okay, I get it. I've seen it. Why are, why is there more? It's also just a case of my personality. Like this book very quickly became a little too mushy gushy for me. Like the main thing of this book is just these fantasy creatures finding out coffee, discovering coffee, and then discovering iced coffee, and then discovering cinnamon buns. Those kind of things. I understand why people find that very cute, but for me, I was just like, this is too gimmicky for me. I cannot enjoy this. On top of that, there was a plot twist that was so guessable. There was a lot of scenes. You know, when you read certain scenes and you just understand like, oh, this is supposed to be like a big scene. It's supposed to be like a big payoff emotional scene, but it just hasn't been built up enough to really deserve the payoff. This book is full of that. And then my main problem with this book was just the characters. Like, I think this book is known for its very cute and quirky characters, but how this book does it is by creating characters that have one defining personality trait, and that's it. Like, you meet the characters, and what you know about the characters is what you will know about them for the entire book. That's why there are so many characters, because every few pages a new character needs to be introduced to maintain the interest of the story, because the characters themselves don't have enough depth to carry the entire story. Sorry, I'm being very harsh. To me, this book made me think, oh no, are cozy fantasies the kind of books that give up on depth because they think that you can't have a happy quirky story and also have depth and then i found out that no that's actually not true because then i read uh, the very secret society of a regular witches which is a super wholesome and quirky and heartwarming story but still has depth and very interesting characters here we follow a young witch named Maika Moon. Love that name. And in this world, the idea is that witches cannot get together because then bad things will happen and people will find out about witches. But she stumbles across this house where there are three young witch children just living there together and she's asked to teach them magic and she's like, Excuse me, witches are not supposed to live together or what's going on? It's really just the start of this very, very wholesome story about finding your found family. Like, this is found family at its peak. It really very nicely goes into feelings of not belonging anywhere, not being able to believe that you deserve love. It's so sad and so beautiful. <laughs> There's also a very cute romance in this with kind of a surly little librarian man. Um, the only thing that I didn't like about this book is that, wow, it is cliche at points. You're gonna find mentions of like, oh, we're all made of stardust here in this book, which I personally cannot stand anymore. Everything else about this book, amazing. So I gave it four stars. And I gave Legends and Lattes two and a half stars, by the way. It's not that I hated this, by the way. It was cute, but 
I was just overall disappointed. And then the last cozy fantasy book I read was The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. Um, I should probably give this book back to my friend who I lent this from because I had this, I've had this over a year now. Ooh, the sun is saying hello. So The House in the Cerulean Sea is another cute found family story. This time it's about a middle-aged man named Linus Baker. He's very much a fan of the rules, doing things according to the regulation. He works for extremely upper management and he has to check on this house with magical children, like magical orphaned children, to kind of see if everything's all right there. But as he goes there very often to check what they're doing, he kind of learning to be accepting of people's differences, learning to let go, learning to, you know, be yourself and not be so strict all the time. What I love the most about this book is the writing style. Fantastic. Like TJ Klune can write. He's a very clear voice. It's very witty, very funny to the point that I would compare this writing to The Good Place, which coming from me, that is the highest compliment anyone can ever get because The Good Place is my favorite TV show of all time. It has very memorable and quirky magical children characters, main one being the Antichrist who I loved, like it's a child and he's the antichrist and he's like, I'm gonna kill everyone. And then the caretakers are just like, can you behave for a second? <laughs> a lot of you guys recommended that I should watch Good Omens if I liked the antichrist character so much, which I did. I recently binge watched Good Omens with two friends of mine and thanks for recommending it to me because I loved that show. It was really great and I should probably maybe read some Neil Gaiman. That was a side tangent. There was just one big thing that I didn't like about this book and that is like a personal pet peeve of mine is that I just really don't like it when books use oppression as like a quirky little side plot for the characters to overcome. So in this book there's a discrimination against magical people and that's kind of all I can say about it. There's discrimination against magical people and then the characters kind of go to protest against it and then people will magically change their mind and not discriminate anymore. And I just really don't like it when a book takes something so serious and simplifies it so much that it really just becomes a little hurdle for the characters to overcome just to tell a little heartwarming story. If you're gonna write about discrimination, there are so many interesting things you can say about this. There's so much you should say about that. And then it's just reduced to a little plot hurdle. I don't like that. That being said, the rest of the story and the writing style were still very, very good, very memorable. And I gave it three and a half stars. The next book I read was the new book by my favorite author, Roshni Chokshi. And that is The Last Tale of the Flower Bride. This is her adult debut and I'm gonna say at first I was a little bit like hesitant because I was like okay it's less than 300 pages like a fantasy standalone and it's less than 300 pages my landlord's gonna come over today so I'm just like listening if he's gonna come <laughs> but I had no need to worry because this was wonderful it was wonderful it took me a little time to get into it I will say, because the thing about Roshin Chokshi is she writes beautifully. She has an extremely lyrical, fantastical way of writing, uh, which the first 10 pages I absolutely adored. Oh shit, okay, I have to stop filming for now. Hello, sorry, the landlord came by for a second, but we're back. I made myself a new cup of tea. So, last tale of the flower bride. So, although the writing is excruciatingly beautiful, because Every single sentence is so packed full of over-the-top imagery. Nothing feels important anymore. You know, if you emphasize every single thing, nothing feels emphasized. But I got used to that. But if you're someone who very quickly finds prose too flowery or too purpley, then you're not gonna like her writing style. But more importantly, the plot. On the one hand, we follow the bridegroom who has just married this very intriguing woman called indigo. She lives in this kind of gothic house that is almost alive. She's very rich. She's beautiful. She loves playing games and creating little riddles for people. And they have this kind of odd, very magical, tense, 
but also a playful relationship with each other, but he knows that she is keeping a secret in her house. That perspective didn't find the most interesting. The most interesting is that we follow another perspective from Azure, and Azure is Indigo's childhood friend. And you see in flashbacks their friendship, how it bloomed, this extremely twisted, codependent relationship that they had with each other, where no one else is allowed in their friendship. It's very clear that Indigo has a lot of power over Azure. And you see how this bleeds out into the interactions that they have with other people, the interactions that they have with each other. And it creates so many situations where when you're reading it, you're just like, oh my God. God. If you hear about this story, you may think like, oh, it's kind of like a folklore story, maybe a romance story, but it's not. At its core, this is a story of a very toxic and codependent relationship between two young girls. And you know, I love that stuff. <laughs> And this is why I love speculative fiction, right? Like there's tons of literary contemporary fiction about these kind of like twisted relationships, but this is a fantasy novel and Roshni Chakshi uses fantasy elements of this like fey world and this magical gothic house to kind of further symbolize and further emphasize the themes explored in this book and oh my god this story will stick with you this story will stick with you i promise you so even though there were certain things that i was like mm -hmm, about at the beginning in the end oh it took me like a month over a month to read this book even though it's only 300 pages and i'm glad that i took so much time reading this book because it really feels like a part of my life now. Like this little chunk of my life that I spent with the story and it's gonna stick with me forever. And I love Rashi Chokshi. Also should be mentioned just as always with Rashi Chokshi's books, this story is packed full of mythology from all over the world. Um, and that's another one of the things that I really love about her. Next up, I read Serious Concerns by Wendy Cope. This is a poetry collection. And the thing about me is I've never really gotten into poetry. I've always had a hard time fully enjoying poetry in the way that I see other people enjoy poetry. And I never really felt like I got out of it what you're supposed to get out of it. But this one came to me because my friend Leora who also has a booktube channel. She bought this when I was with her in London and she introduced me to one of Wendy Cope's most famous poems and that is The Orange. And that poem really touched me in a way that made me think, oh, this is why people love poetry. I get it now. And so I really wanted to have a copy of this collection for myself as well. And I really loved it. I think it's because Wendy Cope's poetry is very accessible. It has rhyme, which I really like. Maybe it's outdated to write poetry with rhyme, but it just tickles a particular part of my brain whenever two sentences rhyme. And I just like reading things that are in rhyme. And the thing about her poems is that they're very funny, very witty. They all have these little observations about life that can be very funny or very relatable and then here and there there's also some very deep and sad poems about heartbreak and mental health and i really like that combination just an example of like a poem that she wrote about um football fans this is a passage that says tottenham lost and i am sad sometimes it's difficult being a lad <laughs> So that's what I mean with kind of funny. And there's also a lot of poems in here that were rejected by publications because apparently she often gets asked to write a poem for a newspaper or publication or something. And then she writes something that is very out of pocket <laughs> and kind of makes fun of the newspaper. And then obviously they don't publish it. But then it is in her poetry collection. Apparently she often gets criticized for writing too lighthearted, writing poetry that isn't like deep and dark uh, and she kind of makes fun of that as well she writes write to amuse what an appalling suggestion i write to make people anxious and miserable and to worsen their indigestion <laughs> sometimes it's just really absurd things like i am a poet i'm very fond of bananas i am bananas i'm very fond of a poet i'm a poet of bananas and i'm very fond very bananas <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys have any recommendations for poetry books with this kind of like quirky witty sometimes even a little bit absurd tone to it 
I really like that and I think if you are someone who doesn't really know where to start with poetry or you think you don't really like poetry this one coming from someone who also thought that genuinely really really nice and now I want more. The second to last book that I listened to is called The Cycle Strategy by Macy Hill although I'm thinking actually I read a translation and it might have a different name in the original version. Let me look that up. Okay so the original English title is Period Power which I'm gonna be honest I really really much prefer the title that they gave to it in the Dutch translation which would be in English the cycle strategy. The cycle strategy much more accurately represents what the book is actually about and that is how to strategize your life around your menstrual cycle. How to work with your cycle instead of in spite of it. So if you are someone who menstruates you probably know that you know your hormones can have some impact on how you feel and the idea of this book is that you can use this to your advantage you know we live our lives on a 24-hour cycle you know we all understand that we have different levels of energy during the day you know you don't expect people to go make a lot of plans at 8 in the morning because you just woke up <laughs> and you understand that you know sometimes when you do things late in the evening some people are gonna be very tired because they're not used to being up very late in the evening. So we're all aware that there is, you know, a difference in our energy levels in the 24 hour cycle, but we are expected to have the same energy levels every single day, even though there are many women that have a cycle throughout the month. And this book kind of goes over the science behind it and some tips on how you can use this to your advantage. Knowing that there's gonna be a week where you probably have a lot less energy and are gonna want to sleep more and there's also gonna be you know like a week around your ovulation where you will have more energy you will have more desire to be social. And I really like this idea. Uh, I've seen this kind of pop up on TikTok and social media more and more this idea that we should be aware that all the, about half of our society are people with a menstrual monthly cycle and we should probably play into that and not just get angry at ourselves when you know we have our down week and we can't really do much and not just expect from ourselves that we can have the exact same amount of energy and the exact same mood every single day. Now I've seen a lot of like videos about this online already but most of them tend to kind of fall over into this this space of like divine femininity and like really focus on like the woman aspect of it which I'm personally not really a fan of. I don't think that me being a woman is defined by the fact that I menstruate like not to mention that there are many women who don't menstruate because they're too young or too old or they have medical complications or they're trans and it doesn't mean that they're any less of a woman and that's what I really liked about this book is that this book very very clearly acknowledges this and also uses very inclusive language throughout the book uh, and doesn't make it doesn't make your period into some kind of like epitome of your womanhood or something. And reading this was very insightful. I, I, I made notes. The book also really goes into generally kind of the history of like menstruation and how historically it has been absolutely condemned by certain cultures but also celebrated in other cultures which was very interesting to learn about. Um, the only thing about this book and this is kind of like a big, a big flaw of this book is that it's like super scientific and interesting and then sometimes she would come with this like blatant pseudoscience just thrown in there between all the other things she would suddenly talk about acupuncture or already debunked things like power poses which made me kind of question the validity of the other things that she was saying. Now I do know a lot of the things that she talked about like hormone wise was very in line with you know what I had already learned during my studies about like the bi biology of the hormone cycle. So I do trust that but yeah there were a lot of like little things where I'm like I don't know if this is true. I don't know if I can trust this. So I would consider this book an interesting introduction into the, the idea of living along your cycle 
Um, but I would take a lot of the things that she says with a little bit of a grain of salt. The last book that I just finished yesterday is A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. This is the famous essay by Virginia Woolf where she argues that in order for women to write and write well, they would need a room of their own and also money. She should not be influenced by like the people around her, be distracted by all the people around her and also needs money to kind of have the same opportunities in life that most men have. Uh, so just like Virginia Woolf's other books, this is very stream of consciousness. So at first it was kind of jarring for me to read an essay that is stream of consciousness. Like those two things tend to not really go together. So especially at the beginning, it takes a very long time for her to actually get to her arguments because she's just having this stream of consciousness thing about her going to her day and then having like dinner with friends until eventually they have a conversation that leads to the arguments that she's trying to make. I think that there's a good quote that kind of poses the central question uh, of the book. <clears throat> Why was one sex so prosperous and the other so poor? What effect has poverty on fiction? What conditions are necessary for the creation of works of art? And keep in mind that this was kind of written in a time where writing literature, especially writing poetry, was held in super high regard, which I think is a little bit less now. And there was this idea that, you know, women could not write as well as men could. You can kind of extrapolate the arguments that she uses here to more current day conflicts, such as the idea that, you know, maybe women just can't make movies as good as men or women can be in STEM as much as men still all comes down to kind of these same arguments where she poses that it's because of the circumstances that women live under that make it so that they couldn't write amazing art. I think the most well-known thing of this essay is that at some point she poses the question, what if Shakespeare had a sister? And she argues that his sister probably wouldn't be able to write the great works of Shakespeare, not because she's a woman and therefore is incapable of writing beautiful stories, but because of the circumstances of her being a woman would stop her from reaching her full potential. That is the central argument in this essay. Let me see if I can find some examples of interesting things because I did annotate the whole thing. She talks at length about how growing up in a world where you were constantly told that you can't do something because you're a woman will probably lead to you not being able to do that. The effect of discouragement upon the mind of the artist should be measured. In the 19th century, a woman was not encouraged to be an artist. On the contrary, she was snubbed, slapped, lectured and exhorted. Oh, and I just wanted to share this. This is one of my favorite quotes about men who constantly insist that women can do things. Um, he chose to hate women, which meant more often than not that he was unattractive to them. <laughs> Just Virginia Woolf casually predicting incels. There are, however, a few things that she says that I don't really agree with. She kind of implies very heavily at some point that the reason that, you know, like, of being oppressed and stuff causes you to not be able to write is because if you are constantly preoccupied with your hatred for the world and the injustice of the world and your hatred for men, then that will always lead to you not being able to write well. I disagree with this because I think that there are a lot of authors, a lot of female authors that have written amazing things fueled by their rage, fueled by their bitterness. And this anger at the world can actually lead to extremely beautiful stories about the injustices that people face. So I'm gonna have, I didn't, I didn't think I would ever say this, but uh, I'm gonna have to disagree with Virginia Woolf on this one. But other than that, I did really enjoy reading this. It's just really interesting knowing that you're reading something that was written by a woman a hundred years ago. And especially at the end, she really goes into how she encourages every woman to start writing and to start working on something, some kind of creative endeavor, because she hopes that, you know, in the future, this will collectively lead to the freedom of woman, women. And it's just like, it's just nice to think about like, what would Virginia Woolf think 
if she saw us today. Like clearly we're not there yet, but we're definitely leagues ahead of where the world was when she wrote this in the 1920s, I think, 1920s? Yeah, 1928. Uh, let me know what you guys read. What was your favorite? I think my favorite out of everything is going to be the last tale of the flower bride. And then against all of my expectations, this poetry collection is a very close second. If you would like to see more videos about books, then you should subscribe and we can chat more often. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you had a wonderful time. I hope you have a very wonderful rest of your day and I will see you soon in, oh, the sun is saying hello again. Well, <laughs> I will see you soon in another video very soon. Goodbye.